Hello and happy Easter to you. This is Pastor Matt, and we had a wonderful Easter celebration on Sunday. Brought lots of friends and family, and it was just amazing. The music was wonderful. It was one of my favorite celebrations I can remember for a very long time. The only thing was the audio stream and video stream didn't work flawlessly, and we want to make sure that you always have high quality audio of the sermons so that you know what we're talking about and what we're thinking about so we can learn and grow together. So I am re-recording the sermon from my home a couple days after Easter, which is fitting because we are now in the Easter season, which stretches for 50 days. We don't just take one day to ponder, explore, and apply the resurrection to our lives. It's a whole lifetime of discovery. So welcome to the Easter season as we dive in to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, which tells us about that first Easter day. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee, There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Gracious God, as we continue in this Easter season, we approach the claims of your resurrection from a variety of different perspectives, worldviews, experiences. Some of us believing, some of us doubting, skeptical, some of us somewhere in between, wondering if we can actually believe these things. If, and if you did actually live and die and rise from the dead on our behalf, what difference does that make? And so we pray now that you would teach us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Impress upon us your truth, your love, your grace. Open our eyes and our ears, our hearts and our minds to the reality of your new creation that is breaking forth like the dawn after a long night. Shine your light on us now and send us out to be your very agents of renewal wherever we go. We pray these things for our good and for your glory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many of you know that one of the great joys of my life is being a part of a swim club called the Dawn Patrol that swims in La Jolla Cove at sunrise several times a week. And I was out there last week as chatting with one of my friends in the water, sun's rising, and this large fin comes out of the water. And when that happens, there is a moment of sheer terror as you're waiting to see what animal this is. By the way, a little aside joke here. I always tell my friends, if I am eaten by a shark while I'm swimming, I want someone to put on my tombstone, he was not fast food. (laughs) Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Couldn't help myself when I told that joke on Sunday as well. And so this fin comes out of the water. And then I realize it's not a shark. It's a dolphin. And then two other dolphins come straight toward me, look me in the eye, swim underneath me. I put my face in the water to watch as they effortlessly were gliding through the water and they came out the other side and went on their way. 
And that moment went from fear to ecstasy. Later on, having coffee with one of my friends. By the way, I'm one of the youngest members of this group. Most of the people are in their 70s and 80s with a wealth of life experiences. And I was chatting with one particular friend and I asked him the question, if you could go back to when you were my age, 42, what advice would you give yourself? Now, this is a person who is one of the most courageous, resilient people I know. He has overcome incredible personal hardship and difficulty that is almost off the scales to create a beautiful life. He's respected in the community. He's kind of been, um, I mean, how do I say this? Successful in business in multiple fields, brilliant, smart. And he's thought about it. And he said, if I could go back to when I was 42 and give myself any advice, I'd say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You know, fear is a part of the human condition. It's said that the Bible tells us do not be afraid 365 times, one for every day of the week, which tells us fear is a part of the human experience and it doesn't need to dominate you. You know, marketers and Political consultants know that fear is an excellent motivator in the short term. This is why we can see political campaigns run on fear, because it moves you. We see marketing campaigns run on fear, fear of missing out, fear of not having enough, fear of not being enough. But you don't need to be dominated by fear. It doesn't need to be your master. And today in this passage, we hear the angels and Jesus looking us in the eyes saying, do not be afraid. So let's look at how Easter, how Jesus' resurrection turns fear to joy by examining the reality of the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, the grace of the resurrection, and your response to the resurrection. So the reality, the power, the grace, and your response. First, the reality of the resurrection. Right now, I know someone's thinking, you know, when I join in on Easter Sunday, I'll go if a friend invites me. As long as there's a good brunch afterwards and a good party, I'll join in with the good vibes and the celebration. But please, don't ask me to believe that a man actually was killed and rose from the dead. You know, this is a good myth. This is a good story that kind of patterns on to the Easter celebration of the cycles of life. Winter is turning into springtime, the dead of winter to the new life of the green of springtime as things are growing. But please don't ask me to actually believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Maybe you say, back then people were more superstitious. They believed these things. They were prone to believe these things. But now we know better. Now we have science and technology and we know better. Friends, that's called chronological snobbery. When you believe that because you come later on the timeline of the world that you know better than those who came before you. And by the way, that line of thinking rationally means people are going to be laughing at your beliefs and thoughts in a hundred years or less. See, they might not have had SpaceX or ChatGPT or a Hadron Collider. They might not have known what a quark or a neutrino or a lepton is. Neither do you, most likely. But they did know that when people die, when people are killed publicly by the Roman Empire that had specialized, perfected the art and science of murder, these people tend to stay dead. In fact, I'd make the case the people in this audience, the original audience, would be more acquainted with death than you or me. In our society, we outsource those final moments often to a professional institution of a hospital or a home. These people would have been around death as just part of life. They knew that when you die, you stay dead. This is why in each gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the women at the tomb, as they go there on that Sunday morning, all expected to find a body. They went to go anoint the body, to um, finalize the preparations of the body for burial, burial since it was done so quickly. On Good Friday. 
They went to pay their respects. They went to mourn. They went to grieve. They expected to find a body. And they were surprised by the resurrection. It was as surprising to them as it is to you and me. Now, someone says, look, it's just not scientifically possible that someone could rise from the dead. Look, you know, the laws of thermodynamics, things lead to decay, to entropy. Things come apart. They don't come back together. We disintegrate. We don't naturally reintegrate. And I would make the case to you, first of all, if you are someone who believes in any sort of God or deity, which is a larger percent of the population, maybe you say you're spiritual, but you're not religious. I would say to you, if it's possible that there's a God who created all life, isn't it possible that there's a God who created new life, resurrection? Or if you say, you know, I actually don't believe in God at all, you're still stuck in a way of answering the question, well, where did life come from? And if you say, well, it just happened, then rationally you'd also have to say, if creation and life can just happen, Can't new creation and new life just happen? Either way, you have to deal with the resurrection. And here's the point. Something happened on that first Easter that within days, thousands of Jews and Greeks changed their worldview and adopted a completely new identity as followers of Jesus. Thousands of people changed the way they saw the world, the things that they knew to be true. Going from God could never become one of us. God is distant to God is closer than the air we breathe. And his name is Jesus. And he's with us now. And we can follow him and be loved by him and trust him. Worldviews don't change overnight. You think about the time that you seriously changed your mind on something you fundamentally knew to be true. You think about it, you talk about it, you read about it, you research it, you discuss it. In the academic world, peer-reviewed research articles are written and torn apart and dissected and discussed. Nobody changes their mind like this overnight. One uh, historian at Yale talking about this change said, Never in so short a time has any other religious faith, or for that matter, any set of ideas, religious, political, or otherwise, without the aid of physical force, achieved so commanding a position in such a short time, in such an important society. Something happened to change their mind. They would say, we saw him risen from the dead. Something happened to change 11 ragtag followers of Jesus, most of whom were uneducated fishermen, who at the time after his public crucifixion were hiding and running. Something had to happen to change them from hiding and running to courageously giving their lives to renew the world. And they would say, we saw him. Not long after this, the Apostle Paul, early church leader, writes to an urban, um, diverse international city called Corinth and he's writing to these to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15 and he says for Jesus was crucified and risen from the dead and over 500 people saw him most of whom are still alive and you can go ask them he's saying check my sources don't take my word for it ask the eyewitnesses now a story like this would never have continued or gotten steam if it didn't happen I mean, think about it. If I told you last year on the corner of 30th and University, I saved someone's life. They were dead. I brought them back to life. Go ask everybody about it. And by the way, that didn't happen. So you go and you ask everybody about it. You ask the shopkeepers and the restaurant owners and the wait staff and the people who hang out at the bus stop. And you search the news articles from the newspaper and there's nothing about it. That story is squashed and doesn't continue. Conversely, if it actually had happened, and you went and investigated, and you asked the questions of all these people, and researched the news, and, you, and it backs up the, the claim, that story spreads like wildfire. Something happened on that first Sunday that made this story spread like wildfire. In fact, even the type of literature, the reporting that Matthew gives us, is not the type of myth or legend. He gives you details. 
He gives you dates on the first day of the week. He gives you names, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. He gives you locations, go to Galilee. He's being specific in his reportage saying, you can trust this. He includes details that you just would not include if you were making up a story to advance your agenda or to start a new movement. He includes the women as the first eyewitnesses. In that particular society, unfortunately, women were second or third class citizens. Their testimony wasn't even admissible in court. If you're making up a story, you do not include them as your first eyewitnesses. You would say the judges and the athletes and the affluent were the first people to see Jesus. You'd get some spokespeople out there. Many commentators acknowledge the only reason Matthew and the other gospel writers would include this detail of the women as the first eyewitnesses is because it happened this way. It's a realistic story. Where when they see Jesus, they don't just get it. They don't move onward and upward, charting their life on a a graph upward and to the right. (laughs) It says they went out with fear and great joy. That's real life. Later, we'll see in this very chapter, it's not the part we read. Jesus appears to his brothers as he said he would in Galilee. And it says when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted you're going to make up a story, wouldn't you say when you saw them, they all get it, they understood it, they worshipped him, and it's been going great ever since. But instead it's realistic. It's like your life and mine. Doubt and faith intermingled, and Jesus meets us in the midst of all of it. Friends, you owe it to yourself to consider the reality of the resurrection. You and I have reason to hold it at arm's length. Because if Jesus is who he said he is, if he really did rise from the dead, if he is the firstborn of the new creation, if he is God, then it means we give up control to him. And that's terrifying. We have reason to say, no, I doubt it. I don't think so. Don't tell me anymore. Because if it is true, it's terrifying. But I'll say two things about that. If you hold this story at arm's length, It can become a cute story to you, a beautiful myth that you bring out once a year, like an ornament, but it will never comfort you. It will never fuel you. It will never transform your life. See, we won't give our lives to him until we see how good he is to us. That he's not only all powerful, but he's also all good. But once you do see that, why would you wait another moment? You're invited to the reality of the resurrection. You can live into it. You can stand upon it. You can build your life upon it. And it's substantial enough to hold you. What are you building your life on? Is it strong enough to hold you? He says, come to me. Which brings us to the power of the resurrection. We see here that this happened on the first day of the week. This is an echo all the way back to the earliest pages of Scripture in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. When in the beginning, the Spirit of God hovered over the chaotic waters and brought creation out of it, bringing beauty and order out of chaos. We find God in the garden, fashioning humans, humanity, creating us in God's image and likeness with honor and dignity. God, the original gardener. And now here we are on Easter Sunday, the first day of the week. But it's not creation. It's the first day of new creation. Where the light is breaking through the dawn. Where Jesus is revealing that he has conquered the last enemy, death itself. And ironically, in the Gospel of John, when he tells the story, Mary Magdalene confuses Jesus, mistaking him to be a gardener. Which is ironic. Because in a sense, he is a gardener. In the beginning, God the gardener is in the Garden of Eden, fashioning humanity. And in the new creation, Jesus is the gardener, 
bringing life out of death. A new power altogether. Turning chaos into beauty. The power of the resurrection is the power to heal all things. To renew all creation. Death doesn't have the final word. New life does. So what difference does that make? Well, practically speaking, it enables you to face difficulty and disappointment in your life, in this world, with hope. You don't need to minimize it and say it's not that bad, it doesn't really matter, as everyone around you can see that it is that bad, and it does matter. You don't need to anesthetize yourself with eating or drinking or shopping or working or whatever it is that you do to numb out the feelings, the pain. You don't need to run. You don't need to become fatalistic about it and say, well, it's just going to crash on me like a tidal wave anyways, so let the boulder fall from the sky on us all. There's nothing we can do about the brokenness of this world or my life. No, rather, you can look it in the eye and say, this is not the way it's supposed to be. And God is with me now and will even bring new life out of this. Earlier this week in the New York Times, there was an op-ed by a theologian and uh, professor at Wheaton College in Chicago that I really respect. His name's Esau McCulley. And he says, Easter has never been my favorite church service. Shouting, Alleluia, Christ is risen, requires an emotional crescendo my melancholy temperament can't easily manage. He says, I've never been a big fan of hope. It's a demanding emotion that insists on changing you. Hope pulls you out of yourself and into the world, forcing you to believe more is possible. Hate is a much less insistent master. It asks you only to loathe. It is quite happy to have you to itself and doesn't ask you to go anywhere. Macaulay goes on to explain his relationship to hatred and hope in his life growing up as a black man in the South. And he concludes, The indestructibility of hope might be the central and most radical claim of Easter. That three days after Jesus was killed, he returned to his disciples physically, and that made all the difference. Easter, then, is not a metaphor for new beginnings. It is about encountering the person who, despite every disappointment we experience with ourselves and with the world, gives us a reason to carry on. He says, so this Easter I'll make my way to our local family church. Not because I no longer feel the darkness that has marked so much of my journey, but because sometimes I still do. Easter invites you to acknowledge the darkness that marks so much of your journey and to do it with hope. gives you a new resilience. This will not have the final word. The final word is not death and sorrow and tears and injustice, but new life and joy, and all things will be put to rights. Which brings us to the grace of the resurrection. Jesus tells the women, Don't, Do not be afraid, but go and tell my brothers. Who are his brothers? Who is he talking about? He's talking about the 11 apostles, most of whom ran scared in his moment of need as he went to the cross. Peter is included among this number, the one who denied even knowing him three times when his best friend Jesus needed him the most. These people had abandoned Jesus in a moment of weakness. And what does he say? He doesn't say, go and tell those failures that I want to have a word with them. Go and tell those idiots who didn't get it right that I'm coming and there's going to be a reckoning. He does not say, go and tell those weaklings that if they're lucky, I might give them a second chance. No. How does he refer to the very people who abandoned him? 
Go and tell my brothers. Go and tell my family. Go and tell those people that I love. Where do you feel far from God? Where do you feel like you're wandering or hiding? See Him come to you now with grace, calling you, my sister, my brother. Your ability to wander is far less than my ability to find you. My ability to forgive, he says, is far greater than your ability to sin. And so welcome to an ocean of grace that's inexhaustible. Come to me. Maybe this is why the Apostle Paul said to the church in Rome that neither height nor width nor breadth nor depth nor life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God. Nothing means nothing can separate you and me from the love of God. He comes in power. He comes with grace. He comes to you. So how do you respond? In this passage, we have two prompts, two action steps you're invited into right now. In verse 6, they said he, the angel said, He is not here. Jesus has been raised as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. What does it look like for you to come and see? And what is the story that you will go and tell? You're invited right now in this resurrection Easter season to come and see for yourself. Whether for the thousandth time or for the first time, to be intentional about what you're focusing on. What captivates you? What are you drawing near to? He says, come and see. This is dynamic and this is relational. If you're considering Christianity, if you're investigating who Jesus is, start with the resurrection. Come and see. Research some of the evidence of the resurrection. Let it melt your heart. Let it challenge your mind. Let yourself receive this kind of powerful grace. You owe it to yourself to prioritize investigating, seeking, and exploring. And that's why Renew Church is here. So that you have a trustworthy community to ask your questions, to deepen your faith and your understanding, to walk together in a spirit of love and truth. But don't let another day go by on the sidelines. The practical steps would be to join a community group through the church website, to talk to a friend about these things. I'm easy to get a hold of as well. But don't let time go by. Make most of every opportunity. Come and see. And for those who say, I I am a Christian, I do believe these things, the invitation again every day is to pray a prayer like this. Gracious God, help me to come and see what you have for me, who you are, who you call me to be. May I meet you in everybody I meet today, and may they meet you in me. Come and see. And then, go and tell. You're invited to commend this story to others with your life, in your words, in your actions. And here's the thing. Everybody has a story that you're commending to other people. No one gets a pass on that. Your life tells a story. The question is, what is the story your life tells? What would it look like if your life told a story of resurrection, of new life, of grace? And to whom? To whom will you go? Who are you called to today? What if you took each interaction you have in your particular sphere of influence, your relationships, your workplace, your neighbors, your family, you said, this is my outpost of the resurrection. And you're invited to embody that very good news wherever you go. Friends, 
in this Easter season, we're invited to receive the reality of the resurrection, to embrace the power that it brings into our lives in this world, to see the grace of Jesus that goes out to everyone, even you and me, now, and then to go and tell with our lives wherever we go. And as you do, your life will be transformed, renewed. But as we do this as a community, the world will be changed. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray now that you would impress upon us your grace, your truth, and your love. As you surprise those women on that first Easter Sunday, please surprise us now with your resurrection power and send us out to be your very hands and feet of resurrection renewal wherever we go. We pray these things in your name. Amen.